Hi, I'm Rohas Nagpal and in this video I'm going to introduce you to the field of cyber forensics. When we talk about the term digital forensics or computer forensics or cyber forensics, it more or less means the same thing. So we could define it that cyber forensics is the science of collecting, examining, analyzing and reporting electronic evidence. This brings us to the first question. Where do we find this electronic evidence? We could find it in a hard disk in maybe deleted files. Now, what we really mean by deleted files is that when a file is deleted, it is typically not erased from the media. Instead, the information in the directory's data structure that points to the location of the file is marked as deleted. This means that the file is still stored on the media, but is no longer enumerated by the operating system. So the operating system considers this to be free space and can overwrite any portion of the deleted file at any time. Then we have slack space. All file systems use file allocation units to store files. Even if a file requires less space than the file allocation unit size, an entire file allocation unit is still reserved for the file. For example, if the file allocation unit size is 32 KB, and a file is only 7 KB. The entire 32 KB is still allocated to the file, but only 7 KB is used, resulting in 25 KB of unused space. This unused space is referred to as file slack space, and it may hold residual data, such as portions of deleted files. Another term that we come across is free space. Let's see what we really mean by this. Free space is the area on the media that is not allocated to any partition. It includes unallocated clusters or blocks. This often includes space on the media where files or even entire volumes may have resided at one point in the past but have since been deleted. The free space may still contain pieces of data or evidence. Now, How do we really handle this kind of evidence? We could do something called a logical backup. A logical backup copies the directories and files of a logical volume. It does not capture any other data that may be present on the media, such as deleted files or residual data stored in Slack space. We have a much better alternative that we could use, and that's called as a bitstream image. Bitstream imaging generates a bit for bit copy of the original media, including free space and Slack space. Bitstream images require more storage space and take longer to perform than logical backups. Another important source of digital or electronic evidence could be a cell phone, where you have information in the SIM card, phone memory, memory cards, as well as even information which is stored inside pictures, you know, sort of like what the GPS information would be, and we have call data records. I'd like to discuss a couple of interesting cases I've investigated in the past. In one particular case, we were given a cell phone, I think it was a Blackberry, and we were able to even recover details of a missed call made to that particular phone almost three years ago. Nowadays, when you take a picture using your smartphone, usually by default, the GPS location is embedded into that image. That means the latitude, the longitude, and in some cases, even the altitude of where exactly that picture was taken. We've had a couple of unfortunate incidents in the past. In one case, a young boy, I think he was in the 10th standard, his dad gifted him a very expensive game for his birthday. So this kid naturally clicked a photograph, put it on his Facebook page to tell his friends about this lovely gift that he received. Now, unknown to this boy, there were a few adults actually who were part of his Facebook friend list, which he didn't know about. One of them was a thief. So when he saw this picture, he realized, okay, this boy has a lot of money at home. From the GPS information in that picture, he got to know the exact location where this boy was staying. And one night, he broke into their house to steal a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, he even ended up stabbing the boy's father in the bargain. This is why we've got to be very careful and ensure that in our cell phones, we keep the GPS location switched off in our photographs. Call detail records are used in a lot of cases nowadays, usually for conventional crimes such as chain snatching, sometimes even murder related cases. 
house breaking and robberies. In cell phone forensics, we usually deal with iOS, Blackberry, Android and Windows Mobile. iPods could also be a source of electronic evidence. There was this very interesting case we solved a few years ago where there was this company which was doing a lot of confidential projects for the government and naturally every employee who would work on that project was thoroughly checked before he was allowed to enter office. There was this one young lady who would show up every day with, with her iPod, blaring music playing on that. Now the security guards would thoroughly check her to make sure she wasn't carrying any data storage devices inside. But the security guards hadn't been trained that even an iPod is actually just a large data storage device. So what she would do is, once she would be in the office, she would connect her iPod to the computer, dump some of the confidential information on it, then delete those files. Once she would reach home, she would undelete those files using a forensic software. And that's how she was actually siphoning out a lot of confidential information. Like I mentioned, iPods, even a USB drive naturally would be a big source of electronic information. Then of course you have digital cameras. In one particular interesting case, there was this lady who gave us a digital camera and asked us to recover all the deleted photographs from that. When we recovered those photographs, it showed evidence that her husband was actually having an affair with someone. And on a particular secret vacation he had taken with that woman, they had clicked a lot of photographs. Then they had deleted them from the camera memory. Well, they didn't really realize that that could be recovered so easily. And this information was presented to the court during her divorce proceedings. Other sources of electronic information could be CDs, DVDs. You'll be surprised to know that even floppy disks are still being used in a lot of industries and they pop up in a lot of cases that I investigate. Then of course we have computer networks, Wi-Fi networks and even the internet which can be a huge source of electronic information. There was, uh, there's some very interesting cases where someone does a war driving as a result of which he gets a huge list of open Wi-Fi networks and then uses packet sniffing to actually sniff out a lot of confidential information. Digital evidence can also be hidden in pictures using steganography, encrypted files, password protected files, formatted hard disks, deleted emails, chat transcripts. In fact, it's not just electronic evidence. In many cases, we also come across physical evidence. For example, if you want to prove that a particular computer is being used by a particular person, you could look at the keyboard that may actually have small quantities of dead skin from his fingers, maybe a hair or two that has fallen onto it. And conventional forensics could prove and match a particular computer to a particular suspect. At a digital crime scene, one of the first questions is, should we pull the plug or not pull the plug on a computer which is live and on? Pulling the plug could mean we could lose volatile operating system data such as slack space, free space, network configuration, network connections, running processes, open files, login sessions, operating system time and a lot of other such electronic evidence. A few years ago, I would built an interesting tool called Vertool which is volatile evidence retrieval tool. It could run from a pen drive, you connect it onto any computer, any windows machine and a couple of clicks later, a lot of this Volatile evidence gets dumped onto your pen drive. Another thing we've got to be careful about is when we decide whether to pull the plug or not, is that what if the person, the suspect is using full disk encryption or he has encrypted drives. Now at the time when the computer is on, a lot of that, those drives could actually be unencrypted or open for us to see. If we pull the plug, we'll never be able to access that data again unless we are able to crack his encryption or somehow get the password out from him. Then in some cases, you may even have passwords being stored in the RAM. A lot of applications and websites, when you log into them, for some time, the passwords are actually stored in the RAM. While the machine is on, you could actually recover that information very easily. There are a lot of international standards which we should ideally follow in any kind of forensic investigation. Some of them are by the US Secret Service, the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence, the US Department of Justice, the ECPO, and of course the Asian School of Cyber Laws. All these standards are open, freely available, and should ideally be followed in every digital investigation. 
write blockers are a very interesting technology that we use. A write blocker is either a hardware or a software based tool that prevents a computer from writing to computer storage media connected to it. So basically it would sit between your evidence hard disk and your backup hard disk. So you would have it in the middle. So it would make sure that even by mistake, you don't end up actually writing something to the original evidence disk. Mathematical authentication is a very, very essential concept. Let's take a simple example. Say in a particular crime, a knife has been used. So later when the evidence is presented to the court during the trial, a witness could stand up and say, yes, this is the knife that was confiscated by the police from the suspect at the crime scene. So the witness can actually look at the knife and come to know whether it's actually the same one or not. Now imagine the same thing for a computer. Which witness could actually do the same thing for a computer? Because the physical computer is not really important. It's the thousands of files inside that are actually evidence. No witness could actually say that none of those thousands of files have been tampered by the police after that computer was confiscated from the suspect. Which is why we use mathematical authentication. So what we really mean by this is that at the time of confiscating the computer, the police would run a specialized tool which would go through the hard disk and generate the hash result. If you're using MD5, it would be 32 characters. If you use SHA, it could be 40 characters and so on. Now, in court, even years later, it can be verified that the suspect's computer or the hard disk has not really been tampered with if the same hash result is generated in front of the court. Chain of custody obviously is another very, very essential concept. This basically helps us to establish how the evidence computer, whether it's a pen drive or how those pieces of evidence have actually been transferred to different people. Maybe first the police confiscated it. Then they sealed it up, sent it to a forensic lab for investigation. Now it has finally been produced in court. So we would be able to prove that during this entire journey from the confiscation to the final trial, every single person who was in charge of that evidence has been clearly accounted and documented for. Now let's have a look at some of the technical stuff a cyber forensic investigator should be very, very well versed in. The first obviously would be a good understanding of the important operating systems. Whether we talk about Linux, we talk about Windows, we talk about the Mac OS, various flavors of Unix. The reason for this is that each of these operating systems would be storing important evidence in different methods. File systems is a very, very important concept. And some of the important file systems that a forensic investigator should be comfortable with are the AFAT, NTFS, High Performance File System or HPFS, the second and third extended file system, Riser FS, Hierarchical File System, HFS Plus, the Unix File System, Universal Disk Format, also known as UDF, the Compact Disk File System, ISO 9660, Joliet, etc. Let's take an example to understand why this is important. Data might be hidden through alternate data streams within NTFS volumes. Now moving files with ADS to a non-NTFS file system would effectively strip this alternate data stream from the file. What it means is that important evidence stored in this ADS can be lost if analysts are not really aware of their presence. Of course, there are many software and processes that are available for us to be able to identify whether ADS evidence actually exists. File extensions, of course, are important because in many cases you would find the suspect has maybe saved a docx file with a .jpg extension. Now, when you would try to double click on it, it's not going to show up as a valid file, but he knows where his information is actually stored and he would first change the extension and then be able to access it. Another thing that's important for us is we should know the extensions of popular software used by the suspects, which may be accounting software like Tally, which may be a gaming software, a gambling software. We need to understand what the different file extensions used by these software are. File signatures are basically refer to data that is used to identify or verify the content of a file. 
there are basically two concepts in this one is called file magic number which are basically the bytes within a file used to identify the format of the file file checksum is data used to verify the integrity of the file content what we mean by mac times is basically modification access and creation times it is very very important for us to know when a file was created used or manipulated now most operating systems keep track of certain timestamps related to files the most commonly used timestamps are the modification access and creation that's the mac times when we talk about modification time what we really mean is the last time that a file was changed in any way this also includes when a file is written to and when it is changed by any other program when we talk about access time we mean the last time any access was performed on a file for example when it was viewed opened printed etc when we talk about creation time this is generally the time and date the file was created but you must remember one thing when a file is copied to a system the creation time will become the time the file was copied to the new system however the modification time will remain intact now different kinds of file systems store different types of times for example windows systems they usually retain the last modified time the last access time and the creation time of the files on the other hand unix usually so unix systems would usually retain the last modification last inode change and last access times different unix systems like maybe bsd and sun os they don't really update the last access time of executable files when they are run then some unix systems could record the time when the metadata for a file was most recently altered now when we take a bitstream image what we must remember is that a bitstream image can preserve file times because a bit for bit copy is generated however performing a logical backup using some tools may cause file creation times to be altered and this is primarily the reason that whenever file times are essential in a forensic analysis bitstream imaging is done to collect the data and of course we must always remember that file times may not always be accurate using viewers instead of the original source applications to display the contents of certain types of files is an interesting and important technique for scanning or previewing the data however there's something you need to be very careful about here is that compressed files might contain malicious content such as something called as a compression bomb now what we mean by this is files that have been compressed hundreds of times compression bombs can cause examination tools to fail or consume considerable resources they might also contain malware and other malicious payloads it is beneficial to eliminate unimportant files such as known good operating system files application files so that we don't unnecessarily clutter up our investigation with going after the wrong kinds of files cyber forensic analysts would use validated hash sets as a basis for identifying known benign as well as malicious files now these kind of hash sets usually typically would use sha1 and md5 algorithms to establish message digest values for each known file now string searches can really help us in perusing large amounts of data to find keywords or strings there are many types of tools that are available and some of the options that they would offer us is to use boolean fuzzy logic synonyms concepts stemming and other search methods we could also use techniques for searching multiple words in a single file and searching for misspelled version of certain words file metadata provides us details about any given file let's take a simple example so we say take the metadata of a graphic file now that might provide us the file's creation date copyright information description as well as the creator's identity if we take the metadata for let's say a graphic file generated by a digital camera it might include the make and model of the digital camera used to take the image the f stop the flash aperture settings when we talk about word processing files the metadata could specify the author the organization that licensed the software 
when and by whom edits were last performed and even user defined comments there are a lot of special utilities that are available that can extract metadata from files when we talk about non volatile data it could be in the form of configuration files users and groups password files scheduled jobs what we mean by scheduled jobs is that the operating system maintains a list of scheduled tasks that are to be performed automatically at a certain time for example perform a virus scan every week on a particular date and time information that can be gotten from this would include the task name the program used to perform the task command line switches and arguments and the days and times when the task is to be performed when we talk about logs it could be system events audit records application events command history recently accessed files when we talk about application files could be executables scripts documentation configuration files log files history files graphics sounds icons when we talk about data files these are basically files that store information for applications for example you could talk about text files word processing documents spreadsheets databases audio files graphic files when we talk about swap files what we really mean is that most operating systems use swap files in conjunction with the ram to provide temporary storage for data which is often used by an application now swap files are basically going to extend the amount of memory available to a program by allowing pages or segments of that data to be swapped in and out of ram swap files may contain a broad range of operating system and application information such as usernames password hashes and contact information When we talk about dump files what we basically mean is that some operating systems have the ability to store the contents of memory automatically during an error condition so that it assists in subsequent troubleshooting the file that holds this stored memory contents is known as a dump file hibernation files are created to preserve the current state of a system now usually this is for laptops by recording the memory and open files before shutting off the system when the system is next turned on the state of the system is restored as far as temporary files are concerned what we really mean is that during the installation of an operating system or application or application updates upgrades during this time temporary files are often created although such files are typically deleted at the end of the installation process this does not always happen in addition temp files are created when many applications are run again such files are usually deleted when the application is terminated but again as we know this does not always happen so temporary files could contain copies of other files on the system application data and even other information when we talk about data from network traffic it could come from various sources such as firewalls and routers packet sniffers protocol analyzers intrusion detection systems etc another interesting uh, source of evidence could be of course jpeg files which can be analyzed for morphing editing or any kind of changes that may have been made to the file nowadays of course wifi forensics or wireless forensics is becoming very very important then of course we have network forensics database forensics in fact uh, on the concept of database forensics i'd like to discuss a very interesting case we had seen some time back There was this gentleman who used to maintain multi two databases with his accounting software. In one database he would store the actual value of the transactions and in the second he would store the smaller values so that he would end up paying a lesser amount of tax on those transactions. Now when the tax authorities seized his laptop they were able to look at the last 3 months records and they said okay he's probably evaded about 8 to 10 lakh rupees of taxes. now when that laptop was given to us to examine we were able to use forensic software and do database forensics and we were able to recover the data going back almost 4 years and from this we could ascertain that the actual amount of tax evasion was not a few lakhs but almost 45 crore rupees there are certain uh, automated tools available for detecting pornography on a particular disk but in my personal opinion they're not very effective although they work on some kind of an algorithm which tries to figure out how much skin is actually showing 
in a particular photograph and based on that the software would decide whether that would constitute pornography or not but like i said as of right now those softwares are not really very effective maybe they'll mature in the years to come when we talk about web investigation one of the most fundamental techniques that we need to know is called a who is search now what this kind of a search enables us to do is to find out in whose name a particular domain or ip address has been registered of course we must understand that if a criminal is going to put up a phishing website he is naturally not going to put up his original or actual details then of course we have the concept of ip tracking and ip tracing let's discuss a very interesting case a uh, few years ago a software professional from bangalore was arrested by the pune police on the charge that he had put up a defamatory blog against a very prominent historical figure now what had happened was once this blog was detected a lot of people's feelings were hurt so they reported it to the police the police then asked the person maintaining that blog website which in that case i think was google as to who is the person who has put up this blog what is his ip address so google gave them an ip address now with that ip address date and time the police went to the internet service provider i think it was airtel in that case and asked for information about the person to whom that ip address had been allotted at that particular time period now they gave them the address of this person in bangalore and he was arrested now he was in prison for about 51 days but still he wasn't confessing to his offense which is when the police decided to recheck with airtel whether the information they had given was correct and it turned out there had been a clerical mistake on airtel's part and the wrong person had been arrested and put in jail for about 51 days subsequently this person uh, filed a case claiming compensation i think from airtel and the police he asked for about 51 lakh compensation and i think he was allotted about 2 lakh rupees by the court so what we got to understand here is we've got to be very very precise when we are asking for information about ip addresses and of course we must remember ip addresses can be spoofed so they're not really a very strong piece of evidence a little off the record those of you who used to play around with javascript somewhere around the late 1990s may remember this activex bomb where you know few lines of code and in javascript and you could actually delete any file on the computer of a person who's visiting your website of course you could even uh, in those cases format an entire drive on his computer so just imagine you're browsing the internet and suddenly you come to a website and while the website is opening you realize your hard disk is formatted anyway getting back to our topic we also in many cases need to analyze the dns records that's the domain name server records especially in cases involving phishing this would be an important piece of evidence of course uh, another issue we must remember is tor which is not really torrents but we are talking about the onion ring network which is a very interesting project started off by the us navy and now of course the world over people use it what the tor browser allows you to do is constantly spoof your own ip address so you would log on to a website sitting in maybe spain but your ip address would show that you are probably sitting in africa so now of course this also poses a lot of issues when we are investigating cases when we realize that if the criminal is using tor we won't really have his correct ip address when it comes to investigating emails there are two basic things that we need to do one is tracing email headers and the second is tracking the emails as far as tracing email headers are concerned we analyze the header which comes along with every email and we could sort of find out what was the ip address from where this email originated of course over the recent uh, past we've seen a lot of email service providers especially gmail where they don't really show us the ip address of the originator it's more or less an internal ip on the 10.10 network that would show up so that doesn't really help us tracking emails is a very interesting concept let me discuss a case or two a few years ago there was this young girl who ran away from home now she wasn't really her parents weren't able to get in touch with her they would try to call her but the phone would be switched off they would email her and she wouldn't reply so when we tried to investigate this case the first thing we did was we sent her an email to her last known account but this time it wasn't from her parents we cooked up an email address in some young boy's name and the email in the subject line said thanks for coffee the other day 
Now this girl, obviously when she got that email, must have thought, okay, maybe this is somebody I've met. So she clicked on that email to read it. She didn't really reply to it, but just by clicking and opening that email, we got to know what was her IP address at that time. Now for this, the technique that's basically used is a small transparent dot, an image which you really can't see, is placed along with the email. When the recipient opens that email, that small little dot, which is that image, has to be actually pulled from our server. And when that image is pulled, we immediately come to know which is the IP address of the computer that is trying to pull that image, what is the operating system, and a lot of other information comes. Now with this information, with this IP address, we got to know the exact location. It turned out to be a cyber cafe. When we reached the cyber cafe, we showed the photograph of that girl to the cyber cafe owner, and he immediately recognized it and said, yes, this is a girl who works across at the coffee shop just next door. And well, that's how the parents and the girl actually reunited. In another very interesting case, in fact, I think this was one of India's first cyber stalking cases. There was this young Italian woman and she started getting a lot of scary emails, so to say. The emails would say about where they saw her running around in Goa. She was in Goa at that time on a vacation. So the email would say, I saw you jogging on the beach. And then it would threaten her saying that, you know, if you don't become a friend of mine, I'm going to throw acid on you. Now, naturally, this lady freaked out. When we analyzed the headers of the emails that were coming, it pointed out that these emails were coming from a cyber cafe in Bombay. Now, when the police went along with our team there in Bombay, they realized it was the manager of the cyber cafe who was actually sending her these emails. He had met her in Goa a few months ago, proposed to her, she rejected. So this was sort of his way of getting back at her. Investigating server logs is another very important thing. Now, when we're talking about server logs, we could talk about FTP servers, web servers, DNS servers, mail servers, file servers, and a lot of interesting evidence really comes up in these servers. Then of course we have financial crime investigation. Now, when we talk about financial crimes, what we've got to realize is that an investigator must know a lot about how the finance industry works. So whether it's shares, debentures, bonds, commercial paper, treasury bills, promissory notes, derivatives, forwards, futures, options. He has to know what this means. Let me give you an example to prove this point. A few years ago, a bunch of criminals came out with a very interesting idea. First, they hacked into the online share trading accounts of a few very wealthy people. Now, as we all know, online share trading accounts are linked with your bank account. After hacking into this, what they did, they didn't misuse it yet. They then went to the on the stock exchange and bought a lot of penny stock, which basically means shares of companies which are doing really badly. So the share prices would be very, very low. After buying these shares, what they did was they then logged into their victims accounts and sold all the shares held by the victims. So now these were shares of good companies. Once the shares were sold, automatically the money for that went into the linked bank accounts. Next step from those hacked share trading accounts, they placed orders to buy those penny stock, which they had purchased in large quantities. Now, as soon as that transaction went through money automatically moved from the linked bank accounts of the victims into the bank account of the hackers. And they made a huge amount of money on that. Now to investigate this kind of a case, naturally the forensic analyst has to have a very good understanding of how financial concepts and the financial industry really works. In a financial crime investigation, we look at share trading crimes, online banking crimes, credit card frauds, internet scams, online gambling, tax evasion, money laundering, and a lot of similar cases. In many cases, we come across encrypted documents as well as password protected documents. Now let's have a look at this. What we really mean is when it comes to encryption, you have symmetric cryptography, asymmetric cryptography, file encryption, disk encryption, full disk encryption, and even steganography, where information could be hidden within a picture. For example, I remember this very interesting case where I think it involved an income tax raid. And uh, the person who was raided on his computer, he had this huge picture of the goddess of wealth as a wallpaper. Now, a lot of businessmen do that. But in that particular case, it turned out was that in that picture of the goddess, he had actually hidden all the files relating to his 
black money and their various accounts. When it comes to password forensics, we have a lot of concepts like there's instant password extraction, it's fake password creation, which is an interesting thing. What it really means is that there is a file with a particular password. We are not able to actually find that password, but we are able to find another password that would actually work and open the file. Then we would have brute force attacks, dictionary attacks, known plain text attacks, guaranteed recovery, and even reset the password. So again, depending on whether we're trying to crack an operating system password or a file password, we would decide what is the best kind of technique to use. For example, when we talk about brute force attack, what's really going to happen is the software is going to try every possible permutation combination of alphabets, numbers, and symbols on the keyboard. In a dictionary attack, you would try predefined words from a dictionary, which may be in multiple languages also. Now, uh, when we talk about Windows forensics, as a forensic analyst, you need to know about how Windows disks, files, and partitions really work. What is the Windows boot sequence? Recycle bin forensics. How to analyze the hyperfill.sys file. Analyzing the various log files, paging files, thumbs.db files, and even registry analysis. In fact, in a very interesting case, we found the username and password of someone's foreign bank accounts, which had a lot of illegal wealth in it. Actually, the username passwords were hidden inside registry entries. Then, of course, we have malware forensics, where we're basically going to handle viruses, worms, trojans basically understand the difference a computer virus usually is going to be there to destroy your data a worm would replicate fill up all available resources and try to bring down your system or your network a trojan on the other hand would basically give complete control of your computer to the hacker there was this very interesting case of a large company and they realized they were losing out a lot of tenders by very small margins now they called us in to investigate whether something was wrong with their systems and information was leaking out. We realized about 163 computers there had been infected with a Trojan. Surprisingly, this had been done by their previous network administrator. He had asked for a raise, they didn't agree, so he quit the job. But before going, he installed Trojans in every important computer in their company, then went and joined a rival firm. And there he would actually steal information from this earlier company and sell it to them. In fact, when it comes to malware, there have been a couple of very interesting developments. One is something called Stuxnet. You must have heard about it. It was discovered in June 2010. Now, this was basically designed to attack Siemens Step 7 software running on Windows operating systems. Stuxnet is believed to have ruined one-fifth of the Iranian nuclear centrifuge by spinning out of control while simultaneously replaying the recorded system values which would show the normal functioning centrifuge during the attack. Then of course we have the Zeus Trojan. It's basically for stealing banking related information. It uses something called man in the browser keystroke logging and form grabbing. Uh, Zeus could also install the crypto locker ransomware. What would happen in this case is the ransomware would encrypt your entire data and unless you paid the hacker some money they wouldn't give you the password to access your data again. Zeus spreads primarily through drive-by downloads and phishing schemes. Then of course we have Facebook forensics, wherein we use different kinds of techniques to try to find out more about what all activities have been done by the suspects on Facebook. Then of course we have Google forensics, which would revolve around you know getting information from the person's Gmail account, the history of his searches, in fact, a very interesting case which had been solved by a student of mine. In this case, an elderly person had been injected a very weird chemical in his neck, which led to his death. The student of mine came up with an interesting idea that let's ask Google about how many people have searched for that particular chemical using the Google site and who come from a particular area where we felt the actual murderer could be from. Now, Google gave a whole list of IP addresses. And from these, they were able to actually track down the young lady who was actually the murderer in this case. Then, of course, we have something called browser forensics. 
Now, what this really involves is looking at the history, bookmarks, saved passwords, cookies, cache, and other things in the various browsers. So that's usually Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, and Opera. RAM forensics is another very interesting technique wherein, uh, as I think I discussed earlier, a lot of times your passwords could actually be stored in the RAM for some time. And if we are able to reach a crime scene where the computer is on, we could actually recover these passwords from the RAM. Then of course we have source code thefts, which happen usually in the software companies where somebody steals their source code. That's like sort of the recipe or all the programming files and the flowcharts that goes into actually making the software. And for a software company, that's actually their most important asset. I hope you found this video useful. That's all for now.